Great movies are rarely about what they're ostensibly about. The setting, the gimmicks, the plot, all of that melts away when you're forced to answer what a movie is really concerned with. And that answer is almost always their most human element. Jurassic Park isn't about the dinosaurs. It's about humanity's greed and capitalism's inability to stop. Fight Club is not so much about an underground network of fighting rings as it is about men's struggle to find meaning and purpose in modern life. And in that respect, 1997's Gattaca isn't about space travel or gene editing. It's really about the human spirit and the actualization of a dream. The 1990s were an aesthetically gritty decade. You've got grunge, gangster rap takes off. Nintendo, family-friendly Nintendo, is running ads like this. It's a fantastic 10 years for movies, with auteurs taking over. Tarantino's vulgar dialogue and action, Fincher's twisted thrillers, Paul Thomas Anderson's tongue-in-cheek characters. The medium of film is being pushed further and further forward. Audiences were being introduced to new styles, technologies, and even concepts. In the middle of all of this, Gattaca releases and resembles nothing around it. It looks like this, and it sounds like this. And the characters talk like this. How many launches are there in a day? A dozen? Sometimes more. You're the only one who watches every one of them. If you're going to pretend like you don't care, don't look up. It's not an accident. This is a movie that is so earnest, the aesthetics of the time period it came out in are just simply incompatible. Director Andrew Nichol had to reach back into the past for inspiration, to borrow from a time when full-blown sincerity on the big screen wouldn't be considered corny. It was expected. The romance in Gattaca is hugely dramatic, much like the rest of the movie. Uma Thurman's character Irene is the main love interest, and she's made to resemble the silver screen starlets of the 40s and 50s. Look at how she's lit here. Uma Thurman is flooded with soft light to the point where she looks angelic. This kind of lighting brings back images of Ingrid Bergman in Casablanca, or Rita Hayworth in The Lady from Shanghai, or Eva Marie Saint in On the Waterfront. There's an innocence being layered onto Irene through the nostalgic imagery. Irene is fitting that classic, pure-hearted blonde archetype. There's a strong influence from film noir here, too. You have the heightened sense of danger, dramatic shadows, criminal drama, detectives, smoking, and a romantic subplot that persists despite the danger. All of these elements are taken from noir. If you compare Gattaca to other sci-fi films of the era, like Paul Verhoeven's Total Recall or The Wachowski's Matrix, there's hardly any resemblance in the overall look. That's because Gattaca is being pulled in two different directions, to the past and to the future. Irene drives a 1967 Citroen Cabriolet, yet it has been made to be an electric vehicle. The computers are supposed to be futuristic, but they look like they're from the original series of Star Trek. And the architecture featured has that same running idea, both from the past, yet trying to glance at the future at the same time, the Marin County Civic Center and the CLA building. The film has a running theme of parallels. Even the very first frames of the movie offer up two different quotes, two different takes on the same idea. Is nature to be disturbed with or left alone? The parallels idea picks up right away with the naturally born versus the genetically modified, Vincent and his brother. Then you have Vincent and Irene, her believing in her limitations and Vincent pushing past them. Then you have Jerome having lost hope because he did not live up to expectations and Vincent's will to fulfill his dreams at all costs defying expectations. 
The past and future are both present in Gattaca, stylistically or otherwise, and it's just another variation on that same idea of parallel. Everything is played straight in Gattaca. There's no wink to the audience. Scenes get more dramatic as it goes, and there's a burning sincerity behind every word. Do you have any idea what it took to get in here? You've gone as far as you can go. You come with me now. There's still a few million miles left to go. It's over. Is that the only way you can succeed, is to see me fail? I'm telling you. It's God, even you are going to tell me what I can and can't do now? The intensity and wholeheartedness is a combination that is hard to imagine in the world and aesthetics of another film. Nothing is more vulnerable than sincerity. Irony and detachment will shield from criticism, but also rob the world from truly meaningful art. In borrowing from the past, Nickel is able to fully lean into the emotional weight of the film and not have it feel out of place. As Michael Nyman's beautiful score crescendos, Vincent says the final goodbye. For someone who was never meant for this world, I must confess, I'm suddenly having a hard time leaving it. Of course, they say every atom in our bodies was once part of a star. Maybe I'm not leaving. Maybe I'm going home. He's done the impossible and arrived at a place he was told he could never be. In some ways, Andrew Nichol must have felt the same. He was able to write and direct a movie that was completely sincere from start to finish. And it's a great one. <laughs>